He, uh, like he said, it was, uh, I am not a, a public speaker like the other last two were, but uh, I, I know a few little things that I've done research on, and I'm just here to share those things that I've discovered over the years. It's uh, the biggest question I get asked, and I'm going to deal with that right away, is why is Cumberland's Hill called Cumberland's Hill? <laughs> and there is no clear explanation. There are theories. Uh, one that I subject myself to all the time is that during the return of the deportation, uh, there were Camos that settled on the very southern tip. There is evidence there of uh, habitation uh, in the woods. You can see the evidence of it. and. Uh, through this oral tradition, uh, the name stayed on. Now, and they must have kept on going up the French shore to settle in other places where the Camos do live. But that's the only reason why we can come up with. The first instant that we see the word Camos Hill written on paper is in the church records of Wedgeport. In 1884, I believe it is, where it's mentioned. Before that, you may have seen deeds that said uh, point to Sluice or Sluice Point. Uh, Donnie Jagger and I have discussed this, and we think that maybe at one time the lower section of Camos Hill was referred to as Sluice Point. In, because there's a Sluice and a gate and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, as you know, the, the lands down home aren't exactly uh, great for growing crops. Uh, there's a lot of rocks. Now, there's a geological reason for this, and, and the last ice age, like Donnie Jackard explains, when the ice retreated, uh, places like uh, in Plymouth, all the gravel got dumped there. Okay, so there's tons and tons and tons of gravel. In Westport, uh, you may have had soil dumped here. Now, like home, there's soil, and then there's rock, <laughs> and all kinds of rock. In fact, we're famous for it. <laughs> Biggest rock garden in, the, in this part of the world. And uh, yeah, there's rocks. Because of the Ice Age, it scooped off and left the rocks behind. And we have nothing but rocks and no soil. So you can't really grow a whole lot. There's a few places that, you know, along the shoreline that has good soil, but the rest of it, forget it. Well, anyway, getting back to the oral story. Let's talk just for instance on the St. Peter's Rock. We're all familiar with La Roche Saint Pierre and La Butte de Croix. Now, these two rocks are the focal point of a mass that this priest from Montreal came and amassed. Which board, there's people living here at the time. It's easy to understand why this priest stopped there and made a mess. There's people here. There's supposedly no people living in Comos Hill at that time. Why would a priest come and make a mess at a place where he recorded it on paper, where he stopped, he left a journal, if there's no people living there? Well, there is people living there. The only thing is we don't know who they were. So, they could have been those Camos. Oral tradition was passed down that this priest did this at this point at some time in the past. Even where he landed, there's a piece of land down Camos Hill that protrudes out in the water, not far from the rock. They call it La Pointe à Monsieur Bailly, or uh, La Pointe à Bailly. Now, I was told this story when I was a kid. I've been told it for I don't know how long. I, don't, I never knew who Bailly was. I didn't know what a Bailly was. <laughs> and I didn't know what a Roche Saint Pierre was. And all I knew was that this was important. Uh, in 1967, Father Clarence Dontremont made a trip down Camos Hill and came to visit Levi Muse. Now, you might. Some of you might remember Levi Mules. He would be Robert Diane's, Mary Jeanette's grandfather. He 
was the one telling us these stories about that our staff, yeah, and about uh, Oak Island and Captain Cook. So you know, you, you you had to take everything into balance. And was did he was he losing his mind? Was he did he know what he was talking about? Yes, he did. Father Clarence had the written history of Pair Bai, Father Bai. Abe uh, Bai was from Montreal, born and raised, sent to Nova Scotia when he was 28 years old, and told to go and minister to the public. He left Halifax the summer of, seven, of 69, 1769, uh, by ship, came to, and I believe he came home first, had his mass at Rochefort, then he came and did a mass down here, but along the way he had baptisms in Pomnico and Kapsab and uh, marriages and all this stuff, and he kept a record of all this. And uh, this oral tradition was has survived <coughs> For 80 years, with no one living on Camus Hill, supposedly. The De Villers weren't there yet, the Jackards weren't there yet, the Fitzgerald, the Harrises, any of them. How did that oral tradition survive 80 years of nobody living on Camus Hill? We don't know. There had to be someone that kept the tradition alive. Because what was written and what Uncle Levi knew was exactly the same. But I he, put a lot of faith in old tradition. He came also, Monsignor Bailly, yes. to administer to the Mi'kmaq. Mm, exactly. Yes. And, and, and I was here, that's Mathieu, right. We, uh, well. That's right, exactly. There were Mi'kmaq living there. Now, on the very tip of Camos Hill, for those of you who are not familiar, there's a, an island. There's a gate where water passes, and there's an island. In French, Lille de Mathieu. In English, turn a pilot. Translate that one for me, I'll never figure that out. But anyway, on this island, anywhere you dig up to six feet deep, which I've dug, you'll find clamps. Clamshells. Anywhere on the island. If you go to the museum in Yarmouth, when you first walk in to your right, the first thing you see are these uh, arrowheads and pots. They're all dug from down home. Mm -hmm. From that island. Yeah. So, yes, there were Micmacs. They were Micmac. They were not only uh, there, but one of the Surrettes, just south of the rock, is that big hill. We called it the train. Down in there, this Surrett uh, found pottery, arrowheads etc, etc, etc. But no one ever, he, he told people, but there's no evidence of it. But yes, it's true. There were people living on and around the big rock too. Uh, the rock also served as a sentinel, a marker. From the ocean, you see this rock, it's huge. And you can see it from a long ways away. So coming from the Publico area, during the deportation, if you want to hide something, you'd want to have a marker, or something to go by. So uh, it's very possible that this rock was used as this marker because just about 200 yards or meters to the north of that rock, is a place that they call the cabano. Cabano simply meaning a place where the little cabin is. And uh, in the early writings of the people from, the, I'll call it public area, but you know, it's, it's all Kapsab and uh, they're hiding their treasures so that they don't lose them during this de deportation period. Uh, treasures can be uh, skins, beaver skins, uh, pottery, uh, silverware, and gold. And they, there is paperwork 
in public art, you'll believe it is. It, well, I don't know where its holdings are, but Museum. there's copies of it anyway. Of these activities going on and burying and hiding at the Cabano. And it's just on the eastern shore. You can see it from this area here if you had a good set of binoculars. We used to play there as kids, uh, go swimming, uh, you name it. It was a nice, we called it Sandy Cove. Mm -hmm. It was a place where you could, one of the only places on the eastern shore you can actually dr drive up in a boat, yeah. in the sand, mm -hmm. and there you are. And you can hide anything you want. And uh, another one of the Père Clarence's uh, investigations when it came to that. Uh, when he went, when he came and seen Levi about this information, he also had this information, this oral tradition about the treasure that had been buried at the Cabano. Uh, not to get too involved, there is uh, a lady from the Pumnico area back in that day who had this treasure, who was sent back to France. Uh, a few years later, she sent a letter with a captain directing the people in Pumnico to go to this specific spot and go get the treasure she had left behind or they had left behind. The captain, being uh, not a very nice man, opened the letter, found out where this was, took the money and there was something like 77 pieces of gold or whatever. There's quite a bit of money. He takes it, makes a roundabout and heads down south. Never to be seen again. <laughs> so he steals the treasure. The guy from Pumnico, I don't know who it was. They have a name. But... So that's one of the stories of what happened to the treasure at the Cabano. So don't be going down the Cabano trying to dig up the place, <laughs> finding the treasure. It's already gone. <laughs> All right. That's so much for oral history. And there's a few others like that, but those are some of the bigger the bigger highlights. Uh, I have a, a photocopy here that I've worked off of for many years. I also try to identify where some of the early settlers uh, was living. Now, Little River was pretty well settled all by English speaking people. Some, a lot of them that had been granted land from the states. And there's a point, and it's roughly where Camos Hill begins now, the line. And then from there on down, that's, they're all French. And uh, the information was gathered in... You want, you want to distribute that? Yeah, we're going to distribute some of these. The information was gathered in 1866. It was done province-wide. It was paid for by the government. They made a map. Then they found out where everybody was living, and they put a dot on the map, and they put their name. And, and in 1871, the map was published. It's called the AF Church map. And it has been a source of, what's well, like a Bible. This map is huge. covers the whole wall, just for this area. And thousands of names are on it. And you can find out where people were living. Now, for that specific year. And it's perfect for our, our time because the people settled in Little in Comos Hill, the French people from this our area, the, the Jacobs, the Fitzgeralds, the, the Villers, all pretty well came. And I'm going to just round up a number here, 1850. Nice round number. Is a few years before, a few years after. And uh, this is only 16, 17, 18, 20 years later, let's say. So all the early descendants are on this map. They're all pretty well identified as who's where and where they're living. Some are next to the shore, some are uh, where they are where we live now, in fact. Uh, some of the oldest places that are on this map are still existing today. Uh, 